Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for making the time uh, to join us today on our webinar. Uh, uh, introducing ourselves, uh, Sam Ramadori, president of Braybox AI. Uh, and joining me today is Jamie Han, if you want to introduce yourself, Jamie. Yeah, good afternoon, Sam. Uh, so again, thanks, everybody. My name is Jamie Han, uh, sales director here in the US, and certainly look forward to the opportunity of taking you through the, the presentation today. Perfect. Uh, again, com uh, questions, uh, comments are, are welcome. Uh, I think we send them through the, uh, the portal. Uh, we'll address them, uh, we'll address them at the end, but uh, questions are certainly welcome. Thank you, Jamie, if you can, thank you. So uh, in terms of introducing uh, Brainbox AI, uh, what, what we've been focused on developing in the last four or five years uh, since we started was truly a, was applying uh, the full capability of autonomous artificial intelligence to the world of HVAC control systems. And um, we, we often refer back to how artificial intelligence is driving uh, autonomous cars that are kind of slowly or quickly coming our way. Um, but basically using that analogy, because it's very intuitive, uh, to explain the, the, the application of a truly autonomous capability of artificial intelligence in, in, in that we can compare what it's doing in, a, in an autonomous vehicle and how we're applying some of those strengths to uh, HVAC control systems in commercial buildings to render, to render them much more efficient, uh, basically render them pre preemptive in how they operate versus how, how they are today, which is purely reactive. Uh, Jamie, if you could go to the next slide. So that's the uh, that's the work we we've been doing. It's been a uh, a heavy technological lift. Uh, that's that's for sure. Um, uh, using what is, I guess, a fairly recent uh, artificial intelligence technology. Uh, that that's been uh, at the core of our development. But also being able to uh, uh, developing the capability to plug into you know a large majority of the HVAC control systems that are out there, uh, in order to create both that ability to to read or extract from the HVAC control system, but more importantly to then be able to write back autonomously uh, at the various output points of that of that BMS in real time, uh, and again fully autonomous you know without human intervention in that loop. And so that's that's been a heavy lift on on both fronts, um, uh, but it's uh, you know super exciting to uh, to to have gotten there, and now we're at a stage where we're you know rolling out uh, on a global basis uh, fairly rapidly. Um, in terms of uh, looking at at what uh, what our technology, uh, the output, the results, uh, certainly we're achieving a very large improvement in the energy consumption of buildings. So we are typically targeting up to twenty five percent reduction in the total energy costs of the building. Uh, and we do want to highlight that number relates to the total energy spend of the building. Uh, we are only impacting the HVAC systems in commercial buildings. So to achieve that 25% savings, we are optimizing the performance of these HVAC systems, commercial HVAC systems to the tune of 40, 50 plus percent. So the, the impact is substantial. Uh, the, the, the improvement in performance is, is definitely uh, something that's very noticeable uh, once the technology goes to autonomous mode. Uh, equally as important, uh, especially as we, you know, as every year passes, I think it's it's getting more and more clear that we need to address um, the uh, the greenhouse gas, uh, our annual greenhouse gas emissions on this planet. Uh, buildings uh, in most economies are the single largest consumers of energy. And within buildings, the, the heating and cooling systems account for by far the single biggest chunk. So uh, uh, we do believe we can make a very meaningful impact uh, to that, to that uh, climate fight. Um, that, that reduction of, of 20, 25% of energy consumption, energy spend in a building has an equivalent, you know, 20 to 40% decrease in the carbon footprint. And we are working on some very uh, exciting innovations there in terms of making the, build, the building's grid interactive um, and, and, uh, and being able to modulate them relative to those greenhouse gas emission goals uh, in a very specific manner. Uh, but you know we're super excited by by the by the significant dent we're making in a building's carbon footprint day in and day out. Uh, we often get asked the question if you're if you're making those kind of level changes or improving the performance by by that much, 
are you putting the occupant comfort at risk? Uh, but we'll, we'll get into describing what the technology is doing, but we're actually improving uh, occupant comfort materially. And the way we measure that is uh, the improvement in the amount of time that the temperature in zones, uh, in, in zones in a building spend within the dead band or the comfort uh, settings that, that the building owner occupants have set. So how much more time is the temperature of each zone spending within that dead band? Uh, and, and we are seeing a material improvement there. And lastly, and I think uh, most importantly, it's, a, it's, it's part of the ethos of our company. When, when uh, the development of our technology was first started by Jean Simon Ben, our inventor, uh, one of the prime, prime goals of the, of the innovation was to ensure that the solution was scalable. Um, you know, there, there are other options in terms of optimizing buildings, some of them that require significant investment and significant upgrades to equipment, uh, but that just slows, slows the impact down. And so right from the start, one of the objectives uh, of other technology was to have uh, a solution that could be implemented quickly. So in our case, we are installing one edge device in actually cases where uh, there are things like a Tritium platform, Tritium Niagara platform, we are even able to install uh, without the edge device by, um, by uh, installing a file directly on the Tritium platform. But either way, it's a very short, uh, less than three hour process to install the one edge device, especially in the COVID period, we're often not even uh, present at the building, we can ship the edge device and install it in coordination with the team on the ground. So it's very, uh, very rapid in that fashion. And then have a period after that, what we call the learning period, uh, where the AI is self-learning the specifics of, of that building, the thermal behavior of that individual building and all the zones in that building. Uh, that is a process that, depending on the size of the building, runs between you know six and 10, 10 weeks. Um, uh, but uh, the, the important thing is that's still a relatively short period and, and two, the, the, it's not a heavy task on the operating team within the building in that most of the work is being done on our side and autonomously by the artificial intelligence. So that's the period it takes to get to full autonomous mode where the savings are being generated. And all in all, both uh, dollar wise and time from the operating, the building's operating team it's a, it's a very low, uh, low time, low cost and low risk in investment. And um, I think that's the main driver why I think we, despite having launched only 18 months ago, uh, we now have a footprint that's in, um, that's in over 16 countries around the world. Um, you know, cr we, like we cracked a hundred buildings just recently and are deploying in a fairly rapid fashion. Thank you, Jamie, you beat me, you beat me to the punch. So we are a uh, Montreal, Canada based company and we started installing in our, in our home territory here at the beginning. But as you can see in 18 months, we've very rapidly um, gone and started installing on a global basis. So I think that's, that, that speaks to the scalability of our solution, as well as the applicability of our technology to many building types. So we really have a broad range. Uh, again, this stems from the art of the, the autonomous, they call it self-learning capability of the technology and then the autonomous control that we really, we can go anywhere from, you know, starting on the, on the, the large end, uh, you know, a two, three million square foot uh, office tower or shopping mall, um, right going down the spectrum to, uh, you know, maybe school, institutional buildings, uh, medical buildings, and then going right down to, you know, smaller retail locations. Uh, I think our smallest one these days are even five to 10,000 square feet. So there, there, it has a really wide breadth of application and, uh, and the scalability means we can install, um, you know, almost anywhere, anywhere in the world, uh, as long as it's, uh, you know, BMS and HVAC control systems that we can connect to and, and communicate with. Um, so super, super exciting to be able to deploy this kind of technology uh, around the planet and to be able to do so in a way that's, uh, that's very impactful in terms of reducing energy consumption and, and the greenhouse gas emissions um, of, of the uh, built environment. So uh, that, that gives you a sense. It's been a, it's been a very hectic uh, 18 months uh, for us here at Brainbox, and, um, uh, but super excited uh, to continue growing the, base, uh, the, the business on a global, on a global basis. Jamie, if you want to go to um, one, one thing, uh, and we did want to touch upon this, especially given uh, all the legislation that is coming out, uh, especially uh, in New York, um, around uh, improving the carbon footprint of buildings. Uh, when you take a, take a step back and look at, well, how are we going to improve uh, the global greenhouse gas emissions situation? 
uh, it's almost always people highlight the four main categories in which we really need to make a difference fairly quickly or we're just going to miss the mark. Uh, and those are the energy, basically, uh, how are we, uh, how is energy being produced and how do we uh, transfer away from, from fossil fuels? Second one is mobility and transportation. So, you know, anything from electrification of our personal cars, uh, commercial transportation, logistics, uh, international shipping. Um, the third one is the food, the food category. And then again, that ranges from all the technology and how we grow the food, distribute it, and what food we are consuming. Um, but the last one is the, is the built environment, uh, most relevant for this call. And, uh, and, and that's one of the big ones. And, and it's frankly one of the more challenging ones. Uh, you know, uh, f production of food is something that happens every day and can be changed every day. But, you know, we put up a building and it's there for 50, 80 years. Um, and, and there's a huge building stock out there that, you know, it's not like it's going to get replaced in any way, shape or form. So we have to improve what is there. And, uh, and so that's, uh, that's why it's a, it's a challenging, uh, it's a challenging one to, to address. And we are super excited by our ability to, to deploy our technology truly at scale um, and really make a difference within a time frame that, that, it, that makes sense. Um, and doing so in a way, you know, when you look at these big challenges, it, it, all, it often feels like a discussion around trade-offs. So what do we need to trade off in how we do business and how we live our daily lives in order to, to make these changes? And, and oftentimes these are not easy trade-offs to make, like really not. The energy transition is gonna be a long and expensive process. Um, what do we do about air travel? We, you know, many of us love to travel um, for the moment, don't know how we're gonna replace um, you know, the, 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 the fuel consumption of, of, our, of our airplanes. Uh, you know, the solution's not right in front of us, but it's something we need to address. The food we eat, how we grow it, again, very difficult uh, changes and challenges ahead. Uh, one, one thing we're excited about our technology is we've pulled it together in a way that really um, motivates the adopter in terms of a very strong financial return, uh, marries that with a very low risk implementation. So our, our technology uh, as we've described, gets implemented uh, relatively quickly. But more importantly, uh, you really, as, a, as an adopter, have the choice also to remove the technology uh, later on if it doesn't work or you want to take a different approach and do so in a way we, we're not changing um, the, the permanent uh, the system you have in place. We're not changing the control sequence in a permanent way. So when we, when we engage Brainbox AI, it is autonomously running the HVAC system, but when you disengage it, the HVAC system goes back to how it was operating before we installed. And, and, and removing our technology, probably shouldn't be saying this too, too much, but removing our technology is one that's, that's relatively painless and, and very quick. So I think that's an important thing because we, 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 we can deliver on the promise of making real impact, both monetary, but also on the climate change front um, and help you meet the goals uh, but do so in a way that doesn't tie you into some major deep retrofit uh, multi-million dollar investment that you can never go back from once you go down that path. Um, so, so, you know, we, we do feel that there's a real opportunity here. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll pass it off to, uh, to Jamie, who can get, uh, who will get into, uh, more into the specifics of how Brainbox can really help you in this journey. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sam. Um, so again, just to kind of continue on what Sam had indicated, I think a big differential is that, again, our solution is really there to enhance and optimize the existing systems and assets that are already in place uh, and do that in a way that doesn't require any additional hardware deployment, additional sensors and so forth. Um, and I, I think that's really critical in these times and with what I'm about to cover pertaining more specifically to New York City uh, is the ability of how do you address uh, carbon emissions, achieve those reductions to reduce fines, uh, but do it in a very scalable uh, and quick way without the necessary need of doing uh, deep retrofits. Um, so when we look at the real estate industry is really caught what I would say in the middle of three primary drivers or forces um, that are really compelling it to embrace sustainability and decarbonization. Uh, the first of those forces is capital markets. Um, so investors today are prefer preferentially deploying capital now uh, in low or no carbon real estate assets. Um, and at the end of the day, since real estate is a cost of capital industry, uh, as there's impacts to cost of capital, 
which is now being more favorable to decarbonization, uh, so too will the real estate industry change. And we're seeing that. Um, the second major force is that we're seeing regulatory changes just like the Climate Mobilization Act uh, in New York City. Uh, and this is occurring in many other cities uh, and it will continue to develop and evolve in other areas of both the United States and, and global cities as well. Um, and I think the thing here that I just wanted to touch on is if you think about it, unlike other industries where if you've got regulatory issues to your business, it's quite easy to pick up and move your business to a more favorable location from a regulatory perspective. Um, but for a moment, just think about buildings, right? Buildings have a permanence to them. And that makes it very, very difficult. You're not going to pick up a building and move a building. Um, so it makes it highly subject to local regulators. Uh, and that's another major challenge that the real estate industry is facing today with these regulatory pressures. And then the third force is really on the demand side, uh, the demand for space by tenants or by occupiers. And we're seeing growing trends that many businesses and many organizations are now demanding that the space or their office locations um, have, have high performing, sustainable and low carbon buildings uh, that they're deploying in. So it's, it's a confluence of these three main factors that's really driving the real estate industry in the, in the direction that decarbonization is really no longer an option. But when we look at the real estate industry and, and to kind of add to what Sam had indicated before, um, just to go over some of the facts and figures, I think most of us understand that the real estate industry is one of the largest asset classes in the world today, uh, but many people are not aware of, of some of the facts and figures behind it when it comes to energy use, uh, carbon emissions, and the amount of raw materials that are consumed by the real estate industry. Um, so globally, the real estate industry today is, is consuming roughly 40% of, of all of the world's energy usage. Um, it emits over 30% of the greenhouse gas emissions, and it's consuming roughly 40% of all raw materials. Uh, those numbers are eye-popping, right? Significant impact on the global footprint of what real estate's doing. But now take a further dive and let's look at New York City specifically. As we all know, New York is a, a very uh, densely populated urban environment and buildings in New York City are by far the largest offender when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions. In New York today, nearly 70% of all carbon emissions is coming from the built environment. Um, and that's why it's really led New York to take the lead uh, and to implement one of the most ambitious and innovative legislative initiatives in the world, right? Um, and it's the Climate Mobilization Act, which I'll touch on here uh, in a little bit more in depth, but generally speaking, it has very strict carbon emission reduction goals that need to be met, 40% uh, by 2030 and 80% by 2050. And so with that, I think it's, you know, it's very counterintuitive, I think, to most people in that the real estate industry has such a large effect on climate change. And most people, quite frankly, are not aware of that today. Uh, and it's because of that reason, um, why it's such a rising urgency and why the real estate industry really has a duty uh, to do something to impact climate change. As due to the fact, I should say, sorry, that it's one of the largest um, impactors to climate crisis today. So when we look at the, specifically the Climate Mobilization Act in New York City today, you know, what does that mean for, for real estate owners? Um, there's several different components to the Climate Mobilization Act. We're not gonna get into all the details today, um, but I did wanna just touch on uh, two, um, one being Local Law 95 and the other being Local Law 97. Um, Local Law 95, for those of you that are not familiar, is really the energy efficiency letter grade uh, um, component of CMA. Um, what has happened now, of the approximately 1 million buildings in New York City, uh, over 40,000 received energy report cards um, last October. Uh, it, it applies basically to structures, all structures that are 25,000 square feet or more, and it is based off of the Energy Star score or the Energy Star Portfolio Manager um, calculation. And I think a major component of this is that it requires building owners to post those letter grades 
um, in very visible spaces in the lobbies. Um, and if they don't, uh, they're going to be fined for doing that. So, so what does that mean? Uh, it's publicizing it, right? It's creating a transparency and awareness around uh, the energy usage and how, how high performing or low performing a given building is. Then the other component is the, the local law 97, uh, which is the second major piece to this legislation. And building owners uh, starting in 2024 uh, are going to start seeing fines, carbon emission fines, uh, that are based off of basically $268 per uh, ton of emissions above uh, a designated uh, baseline. And again, that starts in 2024 and really starts ramping up once we get into 2030 and beyond. Um, and these fines can reach a million dollars plus per year for individual buildings. Um, so very, very strict carbon emission limits and fines that will be coming down the path very shortly. And I think the important part here is not only is it gonna be much more public and transparent, as I mentioned, but it's gonna create a call for action something that they're gonna to have to implement energy efficiency measures now um, because it's gonna to be too little too late if they don't act now, 2024 will be right around the corner. And in addition to that, the other major impact to real estate owners with the Climate Mobilization Act is that it will have a direct impact on property valuations and the overall reputation uh, that the tenants or occupants have of a given building. And what I mean about property valuations uh, new buyers will most definitely factor in any necessary upgrades uh, into the purchase price, right? And they'll also factor in the carbon emission penalties if those are not in place. So it'll have a very, very profound impact on property valuations and on reputation now that it's be, being uh, transparent and made publicly available to tenants that see this when they walk into a building. Uh, it's also going to open up the opportunity where tenants might look at going to competitive buildings um, that are higher performing, that are more sustainable, and that have a lower carbon footprint. So very, very significant impacts uh, coming for commercial real estate owners. Last thing I wanted to touch on is that, you know, many people look at this, that there's a real fear uh, in the market that the Climate Mobilization Act is just going to further hurt uh, what is already a struggling industry, which is the real estate industry uh, in Manhattan today. Um, I personally believe it's the carrot and the stick situation. And what I mean by that is that I think building owners are going to start understanding that number one, they have the real estate industry has invested very, very little in R&D and technology implementation over the years, generally less than 1%, just to give you a sense. But they're going to learn and they're starting to learn already uh, that technologies and solutions that are emerging, just like Brainbox AI, uh, will not only help the owners avoid fines, but simultaneously will provide positive outcome, right? And what I mean by that is we're gonna be able to deliver cost savings as Sam indicated before. We're able to increase operational efficiencies with software only solutions. And we're able to simultaneously provide a better experience for the occupants or tenants in those spaces. Um, yes, the real estate industry will need to wholly modernize and adapt. Um, so it'll be a major change. Um, but again, I think the underlying message here is that it's going to have a major positive impact in the long run. Um, at the same time, though, I think it's important to understand that it's going to uh, require a collaborative effort. And what I mean by that, if you think about buildings today, uh, generally landlords might be doing efficiency upgrades and focusing on the, the common areas or the central plants within buildings. Um, but it's going to be imperative that they collaborate and partner with the tenants in order to achieve the reduction requirements that are necessary for them to avoid fines and truly have a major impact positively on the fight against climate change. Um, so you'll see new forms of green leases, I believe, personally, um, but ultimately uh, it'll be a collaborative effort for this to be a success. And, and again, when I mentioned the I don't think it's as much about a stick. I do believe that uh, building owners will realize uh, that there is really true value creation here at the end of the day. Um, and investing, you know, real estate owners that embrace and invest in sustainability uh, will thrive and those that don't uh, will not. Um, so with that being said, um, again, appreciate the time. And I know we've got about five minutes, so we'd love to open it up to any questions that we received. 
Perfect. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Jamie. Uh, I don't think I see. Uh, do you see any questions, uh, Sophia? Oh, I think we're okay. So thank you. Uh, I'll take this occasion to thank everyone for uh, attending the, the session. Um, certainly available to answer any questions uh, people may have regarding our, our technology and how we can help uh, in, in addressing many of the challenges Jamie just, uh, just highlighted. Um, but again, thank you for making the time to listen to this, uh, to this webinar and, and we look forward to any future interaction. Thanks everybody. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, Sam. Thank you.